to forgive me. Put it in.
Chet and David show us back. Um, today, for a change of pace, pun intended, I thought uh, I'd let the chairman lead off. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, I recently got back from a uh, very productive trip uh, to the Far East, uh, stopped in Japan to say thanks to our great friend and ally there for all their support in the war on terrorism, for all they're doing for the coalition in the Gulf, and for their support and uh, contributions to uh, stability in their region. Then I went on to China, had some very good, candid, uh, open discussions uh, with the senior military and uh, government leaders in China. Um, we talked a lot about transparency. Uh, they demonstrated uh, their desire to uh, increase the amount of transparency. They took me to places that no other U.S. officer had been. I sat in an Su-27 airplane, which is their uh, top-end fighter. I s rode around inside their T-99 tank, which is their top-end tank. They showed me a combined arms demonstration. They took me to their private offices. Uh, they took me to their command centers and show me their maps and their plans and their uh, sand tables. Uh, very open, uh, very honest uh, about uh, what their um, responsibilities were. Good discussion with my counterpart, uh, General Leong, who uh, has a desire to increase cadet exchanges between West Point and their, their academy, increase uh, the kinds of things we've been doing at sea, like search and rescue exercises increase humanitarian uh, exercise opportunities, find ways uh, that we can uh, build trust and confidence amongst our junior officers so as they grow up uh, they'll have uh, long-lasting relationships. Looking to establish uh, between Washington and Beijing uh, some kind of a hotline so we can get on the phone quickly between governments to uh, uh, make sure that any misunderstandings are quickly uh, taken care of. So I found it to be a very useful uh, visit. and. Uh, this week, uh, Admiral Wu uh, from China was here. He's uh, Admiral Mullen, our Chief of Naval Operations uh, counterpart. Uh, so at the senior level, we have a lot of dialogue going on, and we're trying to find ways uh, that are comfortable for both governments to uh, increase the amount of interaction between our junior folks uh, so when they grow up, uh, they'll know each other better. With that, we'll answer your questions. Yeah. Mr. Secretary, can I ask you about the uh, arrest of the British uh, naval and marine personnel um, uh, by Iran and their recent release. Did you see that action as an act of belligerence against an ally? And what steps um, are you considering taking to avoiding a situation like that arising again? Well, first of all, um, I think it's clear that the um, British sailors were uh, well inside Iraqi waters uh, when they were seized. Uh, naturally, this kind of an event um, is of concern, um, and uh, we have asked for, I've asked the chairman uh, through um, the commander of the Central Command and others to examine our procedures and, and make sure that, uh, first of all, that uh, we're playing uh, well within the baselines, just like the British were, uh, and that. Uh, uh, our uh, sailors are properly protected uh, against uh, any similar kind of activity. What do you think it says about Iran's actions, behavior, and tensions generally in that region? I think the honest answer to that question is we don't know. Uh, there are there are some, uh, I think, fairly important unknowns about what went on inside Iran uh, during all of this. Uh, and and it'll be interesting to see what what information we get or or they put out. Okay. Mr. Secretary and Colonel Pace, the United States, of course, is still holding five Iranian members suspected of being members of the Al Quds Force inside Iraq. Has anybody in the Bush administration in the last since this incident occurred had any discussions with the British government about the fate of those five Al Quds? And is there any consideration at this time of either, one, releasing them or turning them over to the Iraqi government, which could then, of course, dispose of them as they see fit? Well, I think there's no um, 
inclination right now to uh, let them go. Um, it's my understanding that consular access uh, is not required, um, but also that uh, Iraqi government officials and U.S. officials uh, are discussing if there is uh, some way, perhaps, that there could be some kind of Iranian access uh, to them. Uh, but uh, as far as I know, um, um, there is no requirement for that and no uh, plan or intention to turn them back. Just to be clear, sir, are you considering consular access, and did anybody in the Bush administration have any discussions with the British? I don't, I don't think that um, consular access is being considered. I think, the, I think the issue is whether there is some other um, means by which um, um, access might be given. And the Red Cross, has, the Red Cross has, had, has had access to them. Have you, discussed, have you discussed anything, either of you, with the British government about the fate of these five personnel? No. No. Secretary, yeah. we're getting up on spring in uh, Afghanistan. Uh, you've said many times that uh, we're going to make the spring offensive our offensive. Uh, has our offensive yet begun? And uh, as a lesser <coughs> question, aren't you still, uh, don't you still have a request to provide yet another brigade? troops for Afghanistan? The outstanding request that we have is for uh, additional trainers uh, in, in uh, Afghanistan, and, and we are looking into that. In terms of the military action, let me ask uh, the chairman to take that. Um, the NATO commander <coughs> on the ground, uh, General McNeil, the United States Army, uh, has uh, begun his operations. Uh, I do not want to get into the specifics of the operations, but it will unfold very clearly here in the next couple of days uh, what, he, what he has begun. But, but to answer your question specifically, yes, uh, the NATO operations have begun. Um, and as the Secretary pointed out, uh, the U.S. requests for forces have been fulfilled. Uh, there are some requests for forces on the NATO side uh, that, that the NATO uh, command and, and the uh, NATO structure is, is working to fulfill. Can you just expand a little on these operations that have begun? I mean, what, what size operations are we talking about? I prefer not to discuss ongoing operations. I think if we disclose the size of the operation, it will tell our, our enemies uh, what they might possibly avoid or, or not avoid. So I, I think I should leave it as describing it to you after it's happened as opposed to prescriptively. I, I might add that um, Secretary Rice uh, and I met um, Yet late yesterday afternoon and then yesterday evening with the NATO Secretary General uh, to discuss principally Afghanistan and uh, the need for other NATO countries that have made commitments to fulfill those commitments, opportunities for better coordination and cooperation. Yeah. yeah um, I'd like to ask General Pace about his visit to China. Uh, one of the issues uh, that I'm sure came up and saw reports on it was the issue of China's anti-satellite weapons test. Uh, what was the Chinese response to this, and uh, were you satisfied with it? Yeah, it did come up, as a matter of fact, uh, at several meetings. I was very direct with them. I, I told them that, you know, as we look at transparency, um, it was difficult for the world to understand what the China was uh, doing with their anti-satellite test. They had not announced it beforehand. Uh, they did not acknowledge it uh, until significantly after they did it, and therefore the world was confused about what the intent was and what their what their policies uh, toward uh, toward space activity were. Uh, they did not answer that uh, question. And is that was that a problem for you? I mean, I'm, and what does that say about their transparency or, or their desire to be transparent? Well, from that specific point, I don't know what their policy is, and I don't know what their intent was. So uh, I, I I I am still as are others confused about what their intent is. There are certain things that they were very open about. Uh, they were not open about that. You brought up the prospect in a radio interview yesterday that a precipitous withdrawal from Iraq or Baghdad specifically could lead to ethnic cleansing. And I just wanted to ask you to elaborate a little on that. And um, isn't it clear from the bodies, the dozens of bodies that show up bound and tortured each day in Baghdad, that ethnic cleansing is already going on? Well, first of all, I, I probably should have used that sectarian violence uh, instead of ethnic cleansing, but but I still stand by the point that I made that I believe that if we were precipitously to withdraw from Baghdad at this point, 
that uh, there would be a dramatic increase uh, in sectarian violence. Uh, I continue to believe that that those who are tortured and being killed are being killed by death squads, by hit squads. This is not a large uh, number of people turning out onto the streets and, and killing each other. These are targeted killings um, by, uh, by relatively small numbers of people uh, in an attempt to uh, stoke the sectarian violence and, and, uh, and frankly, to try and make the uh, Baghdad security plan fail. Uh, by uh, hampering the uh, reconciliation process. So I, I do believe, though, that if we were to pull out, uh, that there would be a significant increase in violence. And Mr. Secretary and General Pace, by your own accounts, you only have two of the five surge brigades into place, about 40 percent of the surge force. Why has it been so slow in getting brigades into place, and how can you judge eight weeks into a surge, how can you judge this summer whether the surge is working when the surge is really more than, of a trickle than a surge? Well, let me take a crack at it and then invite uh, General Pace to comment. Uh, first of all, um, the plan from the very beginning has, begin, has been to move approximately a brigade a month um, into uh, Baghdad uh, in, uh, as part of the Baghdad security plan. Uh, we have we looked at one point uh, whether we could accelerate uh, that process, and 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 frankly to ensure that the 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 one of the principal reasons that it was not possible to accelerate it was that we want to make sure that every single one of those brigades is adequately trained before they actually uh, enter Iraq. Uh, so the training piece of it was important as well as the fact that uh, no matter how fast we get the troops there. Most of the equipment still goes by sea, and it's 30 days, no matter how uh, much of a hurry you're in. And so it, it's been really a combination of log logistics and training that has paced this, um, uh, as, as we've seen. Um, this is very much on track. Uh, the Marines are, in Al are all in Al Anbar. Uh, the five Army brigades that are uh, plussing up. Uh, the third one, as you know, is uh, moving into uh, Baghdad as we as we sit here. Uh, it'll be uh, fully operational within the next week to ten days. The fourth brigade goes into uh, Kuwait as scheduled around the 15th of this month. The fifth brigade goes into Kuwait uh, around the 15th of May. So uh, this has been on plan to be fully up in all categories uh, in early June uh, to be able to uh, continue this. And I think it's been, to answer your, the other part of your question, I think it's been General Petraeus's view all along um, that during some time, at some point during the summer, uh, mid to late summer perhaps, uh, he has thought that he would be in a position to evaluate uh, whether, the, whether the plan was working so far. Uh, as we've indicated, uh, you know, the early signs uh, <clears throat> are positive. I must say that, uh, um, that General Petraeus and, and others were uh, accurate in projecting that once the security plan began to take hold, uh, that you would, you would see a rise in large-scale bombings and other efforts uh, to try and um, show that it wasn't working. Uh, and to and to try and uh, cause more violence, uh, so more vehicle-borne uh, uh, IEDs and and things like that, um, and and we are seeing that. Um, but I think already there there are everybody is being very careful. Uh, I think that there is a a great reluctance uh, to uh, engage in happy talk about this. Uh, it's a tough. Uh, environment. Uh, General Petraeus, I think, has been very realistic in his assessments uh, in terms of what's working and uh, what he's happy with and what concerns him. And, uh, and I think we'll just have to wait uh, several more months before we're in a position to make any real evaluation. Okay. Mr. Secretary, we've heard, though, from uh, some of the commanders in Iraq that this increased level of troops uh, that are uh, associated with this surge with this surge may be needed uh, well into 2008. Uh, and, and I'm wondering, what would that extended increase in the number of troops in Iraq do to the overall readiness? After all, and for you too, General Pace, 
Uh, you know, we're soon going to have at least three brigades uh, returning to Iraq who have had less than a year dwell time. We've heard that, that some of the training uh, uh, opportunities for the troops redeploying to Iraq uh, have been curtailed somewhat. Uh, a couple of brigades were not able to go to Fort Irwin, for example. So what what is this prolonged deployment in Iraq doing to the overall readiness of the force? And what is the state of the readiness of the force today? Let me make one comment and then ask uh, General Pace to answer your question. I have said all along that I believe the decisions on duration and everything else will depend on the situation on the ground. So the truth is I think people don't know right now how long this will last. Uh, I believe that the thinking of those involved in the process uh, was that it would be a period of months, not a period of years or a year and a half or something like that. So the honest answer is that nobody knows for sure. It will depend on the cir circumstances on the ground. But in terms of readiness, uh, John? First of all, fundamentally, uh, Mick, we are not going to send any troop into Iraq who is not manned, trained, and equipped to, to do the job. And that's why the Secretary pointed out that we have them going one month at a time so we can make sure that they are properly trained. And it is true that some units are not going to be leaving their home station, go to California, train out in California, and come back. But they will get uh, the training at their, at their home base, and we will certify. The commanders must certify to their chain of command before the units deploy that their soldiers and their Marines are, are properly trained. What happens over time, to answer your question about, about long-term readiness, is that we will, in, we will ensure, we will have the capacity to ensure that those who are going into Iraq, those who are going into Afghanistan are properly trained for those missions. But when you only have one year between or less between deployments, instead of the two that you would like to have, you then do not train to what we call full spectrum so that if an unexpected event were to happen somewhere else in the world where you needed your full combined arms team that you had been training to that on a, on, a routine, on a routine basis. So you end up with your troops who are well trained for the mission they're going to, but you do, you do forfeit some of the kind of training you would like to do just to have a little bit more uh, readiness in case something happens uh, that you're not expecting. But there's more than one audience here, so let me make sure I, I, I make sure our potential enemies also know that the United States Armed Forces have enormous power and capacity. And at any given time, we have about 200, 250,000 of our troops overseas out of some 2.4 million. We have enormous residual capacity. We have the vast power of our Army, correction, of our Navy and our Air Force still available to take on any potential foes. And it would take longer then for the reserve forces to be remobilized and to get to the fight. But there is zero doubt about the outcome. It would simply take us longer than we would, we would like or that it would if we were not doing anything else to defeat any potential enemy. Which would potentially increase the number of casualties on the US side. You would potentially increase the number of casualties on both sides and the amount of damage done on both sides because you have some of your um, precision intelligence systems and some of your precision delivery systems already committed and therefore you may end up using more dumb bombs for example to get the job done but th so you would end up using more brute force than you than you normally would if you could just start with nothing else going on and, and pick uh, the exact units and exact weapons that you would use yeah. To follow up and acknowledging you don't want to engage in happy talk, but clearly the, the debate on the Hill has been looking for some sort of sign of a drawdown somewhere between March and, and fall of next year. You say things are so far so good um, in the surge. Is there anything you can say about whether or not uh, Congress's expectations or hopes that there be some sort of drawdown? beginning sometime next year are out of the question or that you would pull that out? I, I think that the best, the best way to answer that question is to go back to what I said earlier, and that is any decisions like that will depend on the conditions on the ground. And I think that uh, General Petraeus uh, has said and, and would say 
that he believes he will be in a position to make that kind of an evaluation perhaps by mid to late summer. Yeah. Secretary, how do you evaluate uh, Iran uh, president decision to release the 15 UK sailors and, mari and Marines? And do you think his step could lead in the future to direct talks between Washington and Tehran? Well, I don't think there's any connection between uh, his action to uh, to release the British sailors and what might or might not happen between the United States and Iran in the future in terms of talks or anything else for that matter. Um, I, I would simply say, as I did before, uh, the motives of those who took the sailors, who authorized the taking of the sailors, who moved the sailors to Tehran, and the decision to release them are unknown to us at this point. Sir, uh, get back on an earlier question. Uh, as you know, the Pentagon announced Monday that the two units that would be going that, that did not have the full 12 month dwell time. Uh, this seems to run kind of in a different direction from what you had indicated earlier this year, trying to get the military back on track in terms of uh, deployments to at home. Does this open the door to more deployments of forces that are not going to have the, the kind of dwell time that you'd like? And are we making, is the nation kind of making a transition to a, a different kind of, of, uh, of play when it comes to manning the war? I think I was uh, quite explicit uh, when I announced the changes in mobilization policy uh, in January that, um, that this was an aspiration to get to one year deployed, two years at home for the active component, one year deployed, five years at home for the reserve component. Uh, I was also, I think, quite clear in saying there would be a transition period uh, during which uh, those guidelines would be violated and uh, in which we would be unable, because of the troop commitments in Afghanistan and in Iraq, uh, to meet those, uh, those goals. My hope is that by uh, moving to mobilization by units, limiting mobilization time uh, for the reserve to a year, and by adding to the end strength of the Army and the Marine Corps, that over a period of time we will be able to move to achieve uh, those uh, those goals of one year at home, two at uh, two uh, one year deployed two at home and uh, and one to five for for the reserves. But uh, I think we always anticipated and talked pretty clearly about uh, the fact that there would be a transition time when those when there would be both extensions and violations of uh, of dwell policy. Uh, just because of the measure, the magnitude of the commitments we have. Do you see the transition lasting maybe a year or two? Or I more think that's that? very possible. Yeah. yeah well, you talked about the Army brigades heading into Baghdad. Can you focus on Anbar province and the Marines? The 15th Marine Expeditionary Unit has left or is leaving Anbar. Which unit will replace that? Do you know at this point? Uh, Admiral Fallon will, will make a decision. He, ha he has the troops available to him right now. He has another, another Marine unit available to him right now. He'll decide with the commands on the ground uh, when uh, and if uh, to send that additional unit ashore. Uh, in addition, there have been uh, the plus up of additional Marine uh, battalions, two additional Marine battalions. Uh, so the entire force is available uh, to the commands on the ground, and it will be up to them to employ them ashore as they see fit. Could you expect to have that level, it, it, the same level of Marines there, correct? We'll have the same level of Marines in theater. Uh, right now, the Marine Expeditionary Unit num number 15 is uh, back aboard ship. Another Marine Expeditionary Unit is available in theater. Uh, the commanders have not yet made the decision to put that unit on the ground. They can if they want to. They have not yet made that decision. So, so the line is you're 1,200 short at Anbar then as a result, aren't you? No. The, the bottom line is there are, there are about tw there are 1,200 fewer Marines there today than there were two weeks ago. Those Marines are available to the commanders if they want to put them ashore. They have not yet made that decision. Yeah. Mr. Secretary, there was a report today that Israeli officials had put some pressure on the administration and, and were working with Capitol Hill to try and stop a billion dollar, um, multi billion dollar arms sale to some of uh, the U.S. Sunni allies in the region, Saudi Arabia and others, a big arms deal. Um, is that true? Did the, did the Israelis ask that that arms deal be reconsidered, and what were the reasons that they gave? 
Well, this is, uh, I'm not aware of that. The, um, um, contrary to what most people think, uh, these programs actually are run by the State Department, and I'm happy to let them have the principal action in it. Uh, uh, we make, we, this government makes decisions with respect to arms sales, taking into account what we believe will promote stability in the areas where we are uh, prepared to sell arms, uh, but also in terms of what advances our interests. And I think those are the criteria that, uh, that we have to take into account. We also clearly always take into account uh, the interests of our friends and allies. Secretary, can I go back to Afghanistan? For, for either of you, what are the stakes in this uh, spring offensive, which you say has now, at least on our side, begun? My concern when I uh, became secretary was that uh, the level of violence in Afghanistan during the springtime had increased um, um, fairly steadily over the past two or three years. And, and I wanted to make sure that um, with our focus on Iraq uh, that we did not take our eye off the ball in Afghanistan either. Uh, was the reason why I uh, extended uh, a brigade in Afghanistan to ensure additional force would be available. Um, General McNeil has made additional requests of NATO. Uh, I spoke uh, to the NATO defense ministers in February about the importance of them meeting the commitments they'd made. Uh, I think that, you know, I don't think this is uh, uh, sort of a critical moment. Uh, I think that this is part of a longer term uh, effort, uh, not just to um, defeat uh, renewed uh, Taliban attempts to uh, stake out a position in southern and eastern uh, Afghanistan in particular, but uh, to uh, help the Afghan government uh, strengthen uh, its uh, um, capacity to help the Afghan people for economic development, uh, for better governance, to get control of the, of the um, narcotics problem. Uh, so I see this as a fairly, I, I see it this way, and I think most of the NATO uh, people and our, and our non-NATO allies and partners who are there see this as a long-term uh, endeavor in Afghanistan. This is a country that uh, uh, has spent like Iraq in many respects, many years of war, um, and, and there's a, a lot of uh, things that need to be done uh, to establish a stable and uh, democratic state there. I think we've made strong progress. We want to make sure that, it, that the progress that's been made is preserved and then that we move further. One more question. Just a clarification, too. Uh, General Case, in talking about the, um, the coalition spring offensive in Afghanistan, did, did you mean to say that that had just begun? Because uh, I thought it had been announced that it had begun about a month ago with this Operation Achille. Uh, <coughs> so it, did the offensive just begin now, or has it been underway for several weeks? Uh, the operation you talked about, Achilles, uh, began maybe two or three weeks ago, maybe as much as a month ago. Uh, what I was referring to in answer to uh, David's question was that there uh, is, as we speak, uh, a new part of this un unfolding, um, and that this is a NATO operation. Uh, NATO has a responsibility for uh, all of uh, uh, the um, general purpose forces in um, Afghanistan right now. This is a NATO NATO operation uh, that, um, by name, started probably three or four weeks ago, and will continue now for several months at various levels of intensity as uh, various pockets of enemy are uh, identified and uh, uh, taken under uh, under action. And I'm sorry, what is the name of that operation? And is this it is separate? All, this is all part of the same, oh, same part, of part of the same Achilles. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Can I ask one? Yeah. 